This is the famous Boddington Reservoir. Now this is a mecca for method feeder fishing. This place was stocked years ago with match carp, which have now become big fish, double figures are very, very common with fish up to 20 pounds. And you're probably expecting me to be doing a feature or a video about long distance method fishing, but we're gonna do something completely different. Not only is it alien to me, because I've only been here twice in my life, um, I'm gonna do something even more alien, which is fish a pole. There's a massive head of natural roach in here that ordinarily, even though they're loved and adored, they're often ignored because you just cannot reach the match weights that you need to compete with the carp. But the winter's come, uh, the weather's dropped, and that's when these roach come into their own. So we're gonna tackle them today and see how we get on on the pole. So we're targeting one species, and that means it should be quite a simple day's fishing. So I'm gonna keep it simple in the way that I approach it. And obviously all fishing centers around feed. So the bait I'm gonna tackle the venue with today is ground bait. Now I know that the venue is somewhere between five and eight foot deep, depending on, within pole range, depending on the level. It's winter, so obviously the level's gonna be up. And what I'm thinking is that I need to keep the fish down on the bottom loose feeding into a eight foot of water might mean that I get a few fish dashing around and it gets a bit chaotic. So what I'm gonna try and do is put them fish down on the deck. So it's a ground bait approach that I'm looking for and um, I've actually gone with an unusual mix that most people probably wouldn't um, use and that's, I've used half of what is known as sweet natural ground bait, a cereal based ground bait. This one in particular is Champion Feed uh, Wonder Black. It's a favorite of mine, I think it's fantastic but it's quite sticky, quite tacky, and it's full of food. And the reason I want to use that is to, so I can use it to sort of make my balls quite tight and get them down to the bottom. It's quite heavy and sticky. It'll bind any loose feed that I want to put into it. But this place sees pellets, pellets and more pellets. You know, all summer people fire eight mils in to try and catch the cart. The fish pellet wagglers will catch them short. And when they, even when they're fishing a feeder, it's wrapped, you know, with pellets around it. So. The other half of my ground bait is actually Sonu 5050, which is also a mega favourite of mine. Now that's quite strong, but by mixing the two half and half, that's going to give me sort of a, a toned down fish meal mix, but then I've got the properties of the stickiness, the sweetness and the food value of the Wonder Black. And I've mixed that fairly damp so that I can just bind it together, squeeze it and that'll make a good ball, but not to the point where it's over wet. But I like my ground bait to be able to get to the bottom without fizzing too much. If you're using ground bait, ordinarily you're trying to put the fish on the bottom. So why would you have it fizzing? So try and get enough water in there by mixing it as early as you can during the session. Try and mix it before if you can, if you know what you're doing. Um, and then add, add as much water as you can get away with before you spoil it. And what I mean by spoiling it is, you know when that happens, because when you go like that, you can't break it down with your hands. So that's how I like to, to use that. I brought two simple baits, which is a bag full of casters because what roach don't love casters and I brought a few maggots as well which I think sometimes when it's a little bit harder and a bit colder sometimes it might mean that I pull back on the loose feed and I just feed ground bait with a few maggots in it but ordinarily my main bait is going to be casters and the way I'm going to kick off the swim is I'm actually going to get a separate bowl I'll measure out cup size now I've got big hands so just be careful when you're doing this measure out what you think is going to be a bowl that's going to fit into your cup because I'm going to cup it in today and I'm just going to kick it off with four bowls of ground bait so I'll just do four handfuls and then to that and that's in a separate bowl to that I'm going to add my casters which I'm going to go with one and a half handfuls so then that's obviously a ratio of four to one and a half and that'll give me enough bait to get it down on the deck and but by doing that in a separate bowl I know exactly what I'm feeding and then when I fed that little lot I'll top this bowl back up and use that to work out of so I can control what I'm feeding and understand if the fish are reacting to bait or not. Don't go piling all your bait into one big bowl, mix it all together and then finish up with a few problems. One is you might have got the wrong ratio of mix of, of loose feed to ground bait. Two, if you're using casters, the chances are the air will get to them, they'll go black and they'll start floating, especially when it's warm. And three, you never know if you're not actually going to put any more ground bait in. So don't put all your loose feed into, in, into there and you, you get stuck. So 
don't put yourself in a corner you don't need to and with that simple approach I'm going to kick off the swim and see how we get on as I mentioned to you earlier obviously I've got that working bolt which by measuring it off I know exactly what I've got I've got the right ratios and I've just squeezed together four balls of that mix which is the casters one and a half handfuls of casters in four balls of ground there they give them a good squeeze but you know not to the point where they're not going to break up because you want the attraction and the idea in my idea of squeezing the balls is to get them to the bottom not to stop them breaking up and sometimes that is a, a method where you do want to make a ball of ground bit really hard so that it doesn't break up and you want it to sit on the bottom without breaking up too quickly and that'll give you a different release but today I just want to get the peg going quite quickly so I've squeezed them but not to the point where they're not going to break up and that should just kick us off and then we'll feel his way in from there and then we'll decide if we need either regular small balls or whether we need uh, to lose speed we'll take it from there Unbelievable. I didn't realise how many fish were going to be in Boddington's, but from the minute we've cast in, we've had bites. Now the fish are quite, quite small, um, and that is a slightly bigger fish of around four or five ounces. Almost netting size. And it would appear that we could be kind of inundated with really small fish, which I'm sure that, well, I know for a fact there's a lot of big roach in here. Lots of fish, eight ounce, 10 ounce, 12 ounce. They, they even catch them pound and two pound when they're fishing method feeders. But of course I've put ground bait and casters in, so that's immediately attracted the, the small ones. Now, it might be that they all settle down, the big ones find me bait, I might have to feed a bit more. But my initial thoughts, I mean immediately, with so many bites, I'm, uh, I'm considering whether the approach we're taking is probably gonna result in just a lot of small fish and nothing of any size. But it's early stages, so we'll get a feel for it. You know, like, like these, two ounce fish, one ounce fish. Although they're great fun, and you could probably catch these fishing to hand because it's quite deep, about five metres out. That's not the target quarry. But let's not condemn them too early. Let's feel his way into a swim. I'm going to keep feeding. I'm probably going to just keep topping up with hard small bowls full of casters because if there's that many fish in my swim, I'm going to need to feed them. And we'll see how the peg develops and get a little while. But I can, I'll tell you what's going through my mind. I've, I brought a couple of tins of corn. I might start introducing corn through that ground bait, which will certainly, I'm not going to say it's going to attract bigger fish, but if there are bigger fish there, it'll select them out if you put it on the hook. But we'll just feel his way and see how we get on. I mean, they're not to be sniffed at, fish of this size. You'd be more than happy on a... I mean, I'm going to be fishing a winter league come the weekend, and that, um, if you caught one of them every cast, you'd be more than happy. But we've come here today to catch some bigger fish, so let's, let's hope we can sort them out. But we'll take these welcome... I mean, they're beautiful fish. They look like they've never been caught, if I'm honest. So I don't actually think anybody really fishes for them in this vast, sort of well-fished 
well-known feeder venue, we're pretty much fishing over the top of these and doing everything we can to avoid them. But regardless of size, on a cold day, you, you know, bites are welcome, of course, so. What you've got to do is not drop them off like that. It would appear that we're not the only ones that love a bit of outdoor sport on a cold, fresh winter day. And of course, it's hunting season now. I think when October comes and somebody's uh, taking advantage of the local wildfowl over in the woods behind us. So if you do hear a gun going off, that's not uh, our cameraman shooting himself through bad angling. It's, um, it's the local shooting club, I think. But nonetheless, it's not bothering these fish because the bites are plenty. That I can assure you. So, I'm not gonna wait because it's, as I said, it's like, let's see how this develops. But what I'm actually gonna do is do what I'm thinking and I'm introducing some corn. So I've just cracked open a a tin of corn, and I've put a great handful into my ground bait, which I've squeezed quite hard. So I want that to get to the bottom, and believe it or not, I weren't even confident that the corn would get to the bottom if I cooked it in loose, so I've squeezed it into my, to my ground bait and introduced probably 20 or 30 grains. And that might take a little while for the fish to get used to that. Now we've got that in, but in the meantime, let me just take time to show you what rigs I've set up and how I'm thinking. So I've set up three rigs today. Now, it's quite deep. As I said, the level here fluctuates depending on the time of year. In summer, you can be, there's a lot of steps in front of me here and I think we're right up to the maximum level looking at how this big step is here and the ones behind us. I think this is uh, right full to the top. So it's quite a bit of depth and I'm gonna say that that's at least eight and a half foot. So. I've approached it with three separate rigs. This is my heaviest rig, which is a gram, and that's a wire stemmed bulk. And what I've actually done with that is I've got my shots all within 50 centimeters of my hook, and I've bolt all my spread number eights all together like that. And I've actually got a number eight, a number nine, and a number nine. And they're quite positive drop shots. So it's quite a big float, it's my heaviest float, and so I can see those shots, and it's what I'm gonna call my positive rig. And on that, I've actually got a 14 B911 F1 hook, which is a nice uh, hook for fishing casters. You can put uh, bits of worm on it, but I'm open, and I could even probably put a piece of corn on it if I do need to do that later on in the session. Now, I've then got a three quarters of a gram. Now, not a great deal of difference in that, but that's only got two number tens down. So lightly, slight, slightly light, lighter droppers. My bulk is the same sort of distance away from the hook as the one grammar. And obviously that's the same flow in three quarters of a gram bulk. Now, the idea of that is that sometimes when you're fishing for roach, they can be quite tricky and they're quite sensitive to the flow. And you just need to make sure that you can get those delicate bites and convert them into fish. Often than not, it's like, oh, I'm getting a little dink, little, and just by using a slightly lighter float, you'd be amazed what difference that can make. I mean, I would even, ordinarily, if it were a little bit shallower, I might even have been tempted to go down to half a gram. But what I've done instead is a slightly different float, and this is in the shape of a 416's Cypri. So that's a float for fishing more through the water. And this rig is a spread shot rig it's still got number 10s on it because on a 4.16s, I can't really see any point in having things too delicate. I want to be able to read my shot, hang on to it, and in, in this depth of water, I need to be able to be still be a positive falling through the water, but because I've spread it, I'll get a slower drop. And the shape of that float just allows it to settle up on a, on a slower basis. Unlike the bulk, where the body is short, 
basically the clump of shots that I've got on will just register on that uh, on the foam body and the float will sit down very quickly and it's a quick set float to get your bait to the bottom. This one, because of the elongated shape, that allows the float to settle slower holding the bait up in the air longer and giving more chance for the fish to intercept it. So if the fish are off the bottom and that's how they want it, I can I can use this float. Now I've got it set at full depth, but I will have the option just to slide the float down a little bit and fish a little bit shallower. And obviously that, you know, one of the most important things is that you mark your pole to mark your depth. And then if you do change depth, you come off the bottom, you know your reference point to go back. So you know where you're fishing. And they're the three rigs that I think will cover just about every situation that we need here today, but we'll see how we get on with them. So curiosity has got the best of me and um, I've had to slide a piece of corn on a lot earlier in the session than I thought I would. I mean, I brought it in my bag and I didn't even sort of contemplate using it when I put my bait together and formed my, my plan that I was gonna fish with. But, you know, when there's lots of small fish around, it's always worth having, you know, a bigger bait like that in your armory. And, I have to say, I always carry some in my van, but this morning I put it in my, in my bucket and brought it up and I thought, well, we'll just introduce it because clearly a lot of fish there. And one thing that loves corn is roach. It's a, a sweet bait. You know, it's not pellets, which I'm told that they love in here anyway, but they'll chew that and many a time by accident when I've been fishing for bigger fish like bream and tench, I've actually caught a big roach on a piece of corn. So it's not going to hurt anything introducing it, it's not going to put them off. But I've had to slide a piece on just to see if we can get a bite on it. Now obviously the float's not darting under like it were with the caster on. But straight away is telling me that it's putting off the small fish. And I might have to just be a little bit more patient. And that looked like a little indication there. And I think you're probably gonna have to be a little bit more patient striking. Obviously, we had more delicate bit like a caster. A lot of time you have to strike at small dinks and indications, but with a piece of corn, you've got to let them sort of take it a little bit longer and hang on to it. That's another little indication there. Quite clearly, the fish are interested in it, so might be a bit early for it, but we'll see. I'm sure enough, you've got to be a little bit more patient than you have on caster, but it's had that. Not a massive fish, but certainly a lot bigger than we were catching on caster. So I think that just goes to prove how many fish are actually in here and that they're feeding because first cast on a piece of corn and it's a nice sort of four, five ounce fish. And I've got no doubt that if we persevere with that and keep feeding that, and I'm going to keep feeding ground bait and casters, but I think that if we keep introducing a bit of corn with that, we might be in for a quite a surprise. That might be the bait. Who would have thought it? So that swim has gone quiet and I've recently fed. Now, my first thought so right, that feed's put them off, but when I were walking along the bank this morning, I actually saw a couple of carp in the margins. There's a lot of carp moving. I've seen a few crash quite close in. And it might be that the carp's homed in straight on that bait. I put some extra feed in and brought it right into the swim. I have actually far hooked one already when I first went in. Now, 
you can tell usually that there's something amiss when you're not getting sort of regular bites off roach. If you're catching fish and your swim goes quiet, don't always presume it's something you've done wrong. In a venue like this where there's lots of big fish and there's a lot of big carp in here, you might just find that you've got a carp sat over the top of your bait and that'll certainly put off the small fish and I'm convinced that's what's happening now. So that laid me rigging and that's gone straight under and I've got a funny feeling it might be over a carp's back. And I were, had a little spell where I couldn't get a bite and I, that's what I was thinking it were a carp and then I've started catching roach again and strangely enough I've up this but I'm convinced that the way that the float went in and it went, it slid under as though it were over its back and it's far looked and I'm expecting this to wake up in a minute and realise it's hooked. Because we've got light elastic on, I'm convinced that sometimes the fish can't feel the pressure and um, probably hasn't reacted because it can't feel the the pressure from us and once we get it under a bit more pressure it'll probably bolt and we have a chance of just losing everything but we'll take us time and see what happens because you never know I mean I've got size 4 to 6 zip just through one piece of my pole and the idea of using that is that when you're roach fishing it's a little bit more pingy and what I mean by that is that because you don't need tons and tons of elastic it actually allows you to set the hook better and when you're actually swinging, you know, the smaller, the two ounce fish, the four ounce fish, you ain't got tons of elastic that are just gonna keep coming out your pole. You can you can actually almost, not bottom your elastic up, but you get it to a point where you've got some tension and you've got enough to, to be able to um, lift a fish. The complete opposite to what you need to actually play a carp on. You need a bit more elastic, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I know that some of these fish in here are absolutely massive. And I'm convinced that, I'm just gonna keep on hold of that section for the time being because I might need that when I've got this fish under my feet. Now there's a bit of pressure on that now and I think the fish can tell because he's starting to pull back a bit. So I'm not expecting this to end well. But we'll see. So I can actually see the end of the elastic there and I think somewhere where the fish is is now the bottom, bottom of the rocks because you see these rocks that run into water well I know that when I plumbed up I kind of found the bottom of them and I think that's just about where the fish is now and when it hits this surface it's probably not going to be happy about it but I'm not, I'm not pulling hard I'm just going to just keep some pressure on and see what happens. I'm just going to put this section in so that I can get above the fish when it does come closer to me because I've got a funny feeling that the fish that could be double figures might need a little bit more pole. There you go, you see. And up it comes. Now I know that some of the more experienced commercial fishermen probably would have gone out and grabbed that and netted it and but I like to uh, enjoy the fight and we're not in the match, there's no rush. But that fish is absolutely stunning. And 
I might just need to drop my pole a little bit to get the fish to come back closer to me. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want it to come up onto the surface too far out. So I'll buy just you'll see I've just dropped my pole a little bit and I've got the the fish has now come a lot closer in and I've angled my pole back. And that fish is certainly knows it's up now, I can assure you. We've got quite a long rig on. Not your normal three foot commercial rig. There's eight and a half foot of line there. That's why I've kept that other joint on. And if it comes up this time, we might be wise to just have a little stab at him like that, look. And sure enough, a little bit of patience and a little bit of luck. That is a big fish, look. I'm just going to pull my pole back because I've put my net on for my roach fishing today and it's probably not quite adequate enough, but that is a fine fish. And that is a cracking fish to catch on a roach rig on the four to six elastic. I mean, yes, it's winter and he's not pulled back as hard, but just taking your time, just because to prove that big fish like that, I mean, he's got to be 10, 12, could even be 13 pounds. Superb fish, let's get him back. So after landing that stunning carp, let's hope that that's sort of cleared the way and let the roach come back into the swim and sure enough, first cast back. And that's quite a small roach considering that that's actually on a piece of corn, as was the carp. Um, and I was convinced that that carp were going to be far up because the rig, as it settled, it just carried on going and sure enough, it were hooked fair and square in the mouth. So. It just goes to show you that corn's a great bait and in two chucks that's a double figure carp and a, and a two ounce roach which beggars belief. I've actually started feeding a few casters because I've got so many casters that I thought I was going to be using because I thought we are going to have to keep ploughing balls of ground bait and caster in but I feel like that's attracting them small roach. I'm now trying to feed it a little bit more a bit tighter and I'm adding that corn so I'm kind of holding back a little bit with the caster to try to select bigger fish but I'm just going to lose feed a few down here because it's still deep there and I might have a chuck later on in session. So I've just waited a while there and, and not caught a fish on corn so I've just slipped double caster back on onto that 14 and immediately there's a bite straight away there look and it just seemed a bit odd that you can get bite after bite on a piece of corn and then all of a sudden you can't get a bite on it and maybe it's too selective that was just I just bumped that one off not a big fish at all I think if you were targeting smaller roach, you might fish slightly smaller hook. I'm fishing this 14 because I'm trying to fish bigger baits, double caster, a piece of corn. And sometimes you can actually put a bigger hook on and that will naturally select bigger fish. And I'm not sure if that's the rate of fall that it's it nails it to the bottom more because it's heavier. But over the years I've learned that you can actually put a bigger hook on and, and it changes the size of the fish that you catch, even when you're still using the same bait. Um, and it can only be the weight of the hook really that, that determines the difference, especially if you're using the same bait. But, you know, if I were gonna catch the small fish and try and just catch them, I think, Sometimes a small look just, it goes in a little bit easier and it goes in a bit better. Now this is a strange fish. That's, that's on double caster.
I'm not quite sure what this is. So I'm just going to take my time to make sure we see what it is because it's a it's not tearing away anyway and I'm hoping it's a, a better roach. And that's on double caster. And that is a cracking <laughs> perch. I nearly said it's fighting like a perch. And look at that. That is an absolutely cracking fish. I was under the impression that there's not a lot of perch in here and maybe a good thing because look at the size of that. And often that you get venues. I mean, look at that for a cracking perch. That's an absolute beauty. He's got me two pound at least. Big lesson for me today is that don't presume that how you want to fish is the way that they want to feed. And as I said, we can catch the small roach and want to chuck the ground bait and caster, which is ordinarily a great way to catch quality fish. You know, as opposed to maggots, for instance. I think if you put maggots on, you'd only catch tiny fish. Ground bait and caster ordinarily sorts out a few bigger fish. Um, but there's that many roach and they're that hungry that even the small ones are coming to that ground bait and caster tactics. And just by putting a bit of corn through and slipping a piece on the hook, we're catching quality roach like that, which to be fair, if you sat there all day catching them, I mean, look at that, chomp chomped that piece of corn to bits. You're going to have a cracking day sport. Odd carp. Surprise big perch. And you're going to enjoy your day's fishing. So, I'm going to crack on, catch a few more fish, and enjoy my day. <laughs>